You're strapped in your seat in the vast open space with Earth behind you getting smaller and smaller. All around you are toggles and controls to keep the spacecraft intact. You and two other crew members are working hard at those controls. Out the window, you see some meteorites flying by and stars and planets out in the distance. You're about to be one of the first people to land on the moon after years of research and testing. You have to consider all the steps perfectly. Otherwise, you could face many complications, like crashing into a flying asteroid, or even being left in the vacuum of space without any way of getting on track. Research shows that around one-third of all moon landings faced many problems. Launching towards the moon requires a special rocket traveling at more than 25,000 miles per hour. And once in lunar orbit, the spacecraft can detach itself from the rocket and navigate its way to the surface of the moon and land. Sounds simple, right? Well, figuring out the math to land was the reason landing a human on the moon used to seem like a ridiculous idea. But scientists were able to pull it off by studying and observing the flight of helicopters. Unlike an airplane that needs velocity to take off, the large propellers on a helicopter give it a good push to fly around. It basically has to twirl with enough force to lift its own weight from the ground. With that in mind, we need to consider the gravitational force pulling everything down. On Earth, the force of gravity is 32 feet per second squared. On the Moon, it's only 5 feet per second squared. So we got landing on Earth figured out for the most part. But what about landing on a surface that barely assists you in that? There had to be three steps, doing all the research and math needed for calculating the proper conditions, using a test vehicle to practice in, and using a flight simulator to imitate the conditions of the Moon's atmosphere. Choppers weren't really good references for landing since gravity is doing most of the work, and the spacecraft looks nothing like a helicopter. They needed to simulate a spaceship of only 5 6 the weight of it. Since the gravitational pull on the moon is weaker than on Earth, navigating it under these conditions is vital for when the real thing comes. The scientists of NASA decided to get a crane hanger to lift the spacecraft with cables while simulating the flight and landing. Kind of like stunt actors in a movie with cables attached to them for action fight scenes. But it still wasn't enough to determine if you could actually land properly on the moon without the safety cables to help you. They needed proper freedom. So it was back to the drawing board. They were about to throw in the towel until they came up with a brilliant idea to simulate the landing conditions on the moon by installing a sort of detachable jet fan into the bottom of the spacecraft to keep consistent thrust upwards. By doing this, they were able to create a scenario where the craft would be 5 6 of its weight on Earth and without the safety cables to hold it. But after many trials and errors, the only way to see if landing on the moon was possible was by actually doing it. So, being so far away from Earth, you and your team see the moon out your window. It's a lot bigger than it looks from Earth. Its surface fills up the entire window. But landing won't be a piece of cake. The spaceship has to orbit around the moon to determine the best time to land. And don't worry, that's why you have a team for that. It can take more than 24 hours to know when and where the perfect place to land is after performing various tests and measurements. And once you get the best calculations, the actual spaceship detaches from the orbiting one and makes its way downwards. This is where the helicopter physics come into play. A helicopter needs to tilt at least 5 degrees to move forward after ascending from the ground. Same for going backwards. But that's because we have gravity to assist it. Up above the moon, soaring through the vacuum of space, the ship would need to tilt at least 30 to 40 degrees to move forward. As soon as the ship reached a nice spot for landing, it would go back to 90 degrees and slowly land on the surface. As you get closer, you can see the moon's surface just a few feet away. This is the tricky part, but it's a success. The team back on Earth couldn't be happier. The crew members are also thrilled about what you've achieved. You put on your spacesuit and gear and climb down the ladder. 
You leave your first footprint on the moon and look out at the distance ahead of you. The Earth is just a little blue dot far away. You're able to bounce around in the near-zero gravity. Now, that's what I call moonwalking. After spending much time on the moon, it's time to head back. Neil Armstrong, the first man to step on the moon, spent only about two and a half hours on its surface before returning. But, oh no, you forgot the keys inside the ship and now you're stranded. Nah, just kidding. Although it would have made a good plot twist. You get back and launch the spacecraft back into orbit to reunite with the other ship above you. And once you've reattached, you exit the moon's orbit and head back to Earth. By sending humans to the moon consistently, the next big step can be achieved by landing on Mars. The famous exploration rover Curiosity traveled around the surface of Mars and gathered information needed for humans to land there. And NASA is aiming to have the first humans up there after 2030. The journey will be hundreds of times harder than the one towards the moon. But many scientific questions will be answered once it happens. Humans may be able to gather some of the natural resources there and even build outposts and colonies. There are endless possibilities as well as challenges. The journey from the Earth to the Moon is around 250,000 miles. Mars is around 35 million miles away. There could be a possibility of a new human outpost stationed on Mars. Building a new society of scientists and engineers to make the most out of the conditions. It would be completely self-sufficient, providing proper ways for farming and agriculture. And by having humans on Mars for so long, scientists can properly understand the planet. But to understand how the human body responds to deep space environment, we'd have to have a lot of practice before getting that ticket to Mars. The closest experience of having a colony in the middle of nowhere is the Amazon Scott Station on the South Pole. It's designed to withstand all the harsh conditions of the freezing dry coal. Being at the bottom of the world can be pretty stressful without proper practice. The journey may not be as far as Mars or the Moon. But being on the South Pole is like arriving on a whole new planet. The station itself is equipped to provide the proper conditions everyone needs to be comfortable. Besides the strong heating system, the station has a recreational room for sports and music a library, a lounge, and even a greenhouse to grow all the right veggies and fruits. In fact, the greenhouse is the only way you'd get to feel like you're in a rainforest. And even before applying there, you'd have to get screened to see if you can handle the isolation for months. Not that you'd be completely alone, but still away from civilization. Antarctica's whole population consists of scientists and engineers. And you need to be examined by a doctor to determine if you're physically fit to stay there. The station is built there for scientists to study space and things related to geology. Being in the biggest desert in the world can take its toll on you. When leaving the station, you have to wear at least three layers of gloves and extremely thick sweaters and jackets to withstand the cold. They even compared stepping on the South Pole to walking on the moon. It's been decades since the last manned moon landing, Apollo 17, which happened in December 1972. Isn't it time we thought about going back to our dusty satellite and maybe even staying there? NASA has made a promise on this subject. They're preparing to send astronauts on the moon again, perhaps by 2025. This will all happen through a program called Artemis. It's also going to include the first woman ever to experience the lunar surface. Now you might ask, why haven't we done this already? One former NASA administrator said something interesting on the subject. It's not because of scientific or technological issues. Problem was that the potential projects took too long and were just too costly. You see, space travel, especially when it involves humans, isn't easy on the pockets. It's true that, in recent years, NASA had budgets of billions of dollars. Sure sounds like enough money, right? Well, not when you check out their to-do list. 
That's because they have to consider everything. From telescopes and giant rocket projects to missions also targeting the Sun, Jupiter, Mars, and beyond. When you look at it this way, NASA needs to be very good at budgeting to achieve all those goals. It's not just because of finances, though. The moon itself is quite problematic. It poses real dangers that cannot be taken lightly. For starters, its surface is filled with craters and boulders that aren't easy to land on. Then, there is the moon dust, or regolith, if you'd like to call it by its scientific name. It was created over many years by meteorite impacts. It's extremely harsh and sticks to everything. It can potentially damage spacesuits, vehicles, and systems quite quickly. Also, dealing with the lunar habitat isn't a walk in the park either. The moon has no protective atmosphere. What this means is that for 14 days at a time, the lunar surface is faced with harsh rays from the sun. That period is followed by another two weeks of total darkness. All these changes create extreme temperatures, which us humans are not really accustomed to. There are solutions, don't worry. NASA is working on dust and sun, resistant spacesuits and vehicles. They're even developing a system that might supply electricity during those lunar nights. What's even more interesting about this system is it could come in handy on Mars too, once we get there. NASA also needs to draw in really smart people for its projects. Think about it. The average age of the people working for the mission control for Apollo 13 was just 26 years old. And these people had already been part of numerous missions by that time. Which means they'd had considerable experience from a very young age. But here's where other individuals can help too. In recent years, it wasn't just NASA who's been working tirelessly to revolutionize space travel. There are many successful people out there with enough resources to join in on these efforts. Some are developing new types of rockets that can land on the moon, too. In total, NASA landed 12 people on our satellite. It's definitely one of the most awesome moments in its history, if not the best. And those astronauts did amazing things up there. They brought back rocks, took snapshots, did science experiments, and even left flags behind. These were all important moments of the Apollo missions. But they weren't meant to create a safe place for humans on the moon. Scientists have had this idea of a lunar space station for a long time now. It's only logical. After all, it's just a three-day trip from Earth. It means we can, technically, afford to make little mistakes here and there without messing up the whole project. Plus, we'd learn so much before venturing even further into space. A moon base could provide fuel for deep space missions. We could also build telescopes up there and launch them way easier in space. It could also help us in another important project, figure out how to make Mars habitable too. Not to mention, a lunar space station would help us learn more about the moon's origin who knows, it could even bring in some money because of all that fun, exciting lunar tourism. Either way, the Apollo Moon program took a lot of work. For starters, let's look at the sheer number of people involved. Around 400,000 from every corner of the states. Not everything was picture perfect, tough. There were two main unfortunate events. Firstly, a fire mishap at the launch pad of Apollo 1. Secondly, an oxygen tank decided to throw a tantrum on Apollo 13, causing severe issues mid-mission. An important part of the project was Saturn V. It is to this day the most powerful rocket flown successfully, being 36 stories high. Still finding it hard to picture? This rocket stood twice as tall as Niagara Falls, Thanks to Saturn V, NASA successfully completed 13 missions. This included chauffeuring 24 astronauts towards the moon, with half of them even having a little walk on its surface. The existing rockets and space shuttles can't go beyond low Earth orbit. 
In simpler terms, they can't reach the moon with all the gadgets astronauts need to thrive. Current space vehicles are just not capable of carrying that load, at least not since the Apollo missions happened. Regardless, we did make a lot of progress on Earth and are ready to send astronauts to our satellite pretty soon. Here's where the Artemis project comes in. It's a program overseen by NASA. And to make sure it all goes well, NASA previously launched Orion, a spacecraft with no crew on board to orbit the moon and return to Earth. Think of it as an automated test drive. Before we actually send people out there again, we need to make sure all the devices work properly. One day, Orion will be the vehicle that will take astronauts to the moon again. It features a launch abort system to keep astronauts safe in case something bad happens during launch. It also has a service module, which is the powerhouse that fuels and propels Orion and keeps astronauts alive with water, oxygen, power, and temperature control. All these future projects make one wonder, what will life on the moon be like anyway? We can only use our imagination for now. Some say we'll be living in homes straight out of a fairy tale, something like a cozy hobbit hole. Living underground on the moon might be a must. That's due to the scorching temperatures and the lack of oxygen. If you add meteorite threats and the non-stop radiation, it's no wonder we can't just walk on its surface. What about transportation? Big and small companies alike are trying to create the ideal moon ride. If current estimations are current, one type of moon taxi will take off as soon as 2024. Unlike our current rockets, these space taxis won't have to deal with the harsh conditions of re-entering Earth's atmosphere. It will be easier for them to make multiple round trips. To support our lunar living, we'll need to have a special area for space taxis to safely take off and land. Think of it as a landing pad on a firm, flat stretch of moon surface, protected by walls to shield against moon dust. Moving around on the moon surface will be made easier too. The next generation vehicles we're talking about will have their own controlled environment, which means you won't need a spacesuit while inside. Should feel like stepping out of your space ride for a bit. Then of course, you'll need to put on your spacesuit. All right. So we've got our homes and our rides sorted. But what about fuel? That's where the moon throws us a lifeline. The moon's lighter gravity means we don't need as much power to escape its pull. Plus, the moon has ice, and that's super handy. We might be able to convert this ice into rocket fuel. We'll need dedicated space gadgets to help gather this ice. One such tool is called Trident. It's like a drill, perfect for digging into the icy moon surface. Additional robotic helpers would then turn this ice into fuel and deliver it to a space gas station. If this works, rockets on their way to Mars could stop by for a quick fuel top-up before continuing their journey. In 1969, when the first moon landing took place, not everybody believed it really happened. Some folks didn't trust what they saw on TV. They thought the footage looked cool, but all this might have simply been staged, like a scene on a movie set. Or they thought, how could we really have the technology to send humans all the way to the moon? And even years later, some people are still skeptical about it, even though there's thousands of pieces of evidence to prove that all the lunar landings actually occurred. Some of such non-credible theories even claim that the Apollo landing had happened somewhere in a desert in Arizona or Nevada. Some people thought the United States had pretended to go to the moon to win the space race against other countries. Others were sure the moon landing was a way to distract people from real problems. And in a way, it certainly did do that. Well, there are facts and there are fantasies. So let's take a closer look at this to set the record straight. First, about the photos. Doubters claim that since there was no Earth's light pollution or atmosphere on the moon, we should see thousands of stars in the picture. But this argument didn't take into consideration one crucial thing. The astronauts took the photos during the daytime on the moon. The sun was shining brightly, which made the moon's surface very bright. 
That's why the starlight was too faint to compete in the pictures. Another argument that doubters decided to raise was that the crosshairs in the photos sometimes appeared to be behind objects, which, in their opinion, suggested they had been painted on. But experiments made back on Earth showed that when an object was brightly lit, it could make the crosshairs appear fainter in the photo. And then, when you copy or scan the images, some of the details end up being lost. This creates the illusion that the crosshairs are behind the object. Yet another claim revolved around the American flag the astronauts had planted on the moon. In some photos, the flag seems to be fluttering in the wind. But hey, we all know there's no wind on the moon because there's no atmosphere. Actually, the flag appears to be fluttering because the horizontal rod at the top of the pole keeps it unfurled. The moon has a weak gravity not strong enough to straighten the flag out completely and create this slight waving effect. Some of the doubtful folks also point to a photo of a moon rock from the Apollo 16 mission that appeared to have the letter C written on it, like a prop in a movie. But after closer analysis of the original photo, they agreed that the C was probably just a piece of hair or thread that ended there during the copying process. Okay, here's one legit argument skeptics also like to bring up. The radiation in space might be too harsh to handle. There's this thing called the Van Allen radiation belts. These belts are like giant donuts around Earth, and they're filled not with creamy goodness, but with solar particles. Some people believe that astronauts couldn't have survived passing through these belts. Yes, being fried by radiation was indeed an important thing to be concerned about before the Apollo missions. The scientists and engineers that worked on the Apollo program wanted to make sure the astronauts would be safe. So they took several measures to protect the astronauts from radiation. For example, they used an aluminum shell to keep the spacecraft safe from radiation. Plus, they had to plan the entire trip from Earth to the Moon really carefully so that the astronauts spent as little time as possible in the Van Allen belts. And the average radiation these brave astronauts were exposed to was 0.46 rad, which stands for radiation-absorbed dose. This might sound like a lot at first. After all, it's around 10 times more than the radiation exposure of medical professionals who regularly work with X-ray and radiotherapy machines. But it's well within benign limits. NASA managed to keep the astronauts safe. We have so many records from the Apollo missions, including 8,400 photos, videos, scientific data, and audio recordings of conversations between the astronauts and mission control. They even brought us some souvenirs, about 840 pounds of moon rocks to study. But it doesn't stop there. NASA's spacecraft continues to orbit the moon. It takes incredibly detailed pictures of the lunar surface. It's captured some cool images of the Apollo landing site and shown us abandoned modules and rovers the astronauts left behind. The resolution is so good that we can even see the footprints they left. Plus, during the Apollo 11 mission, the astronauts installed a special instrument on the moon called the Laser Ranging Retro Reflector. Yes, another technical mouthful from NASA. This device helps scientists measure distances by bouncing laser beams off the moon. Now that would be impossible to do if someone hadn't landed on the moon and deployed the thing. So, some hardened skeptics do believe we sent robots up there. They just don't think there were human astronauts really walking on the moon. They claim that the astronauts pretended to orbit the moon and walk on its surface using special camera tricks. There are also people who believe that humans did go to the moon, but they're also sure that some beings from other planets assisted them. They claim that the astronauts were hypnotized to remove their memories of meeting these unusual creatures from outer space. Well, human imagination has no limits. Neither does foolishness. But keep in mind that with a telescope that's good enough, you can see the Apollo landing sites yourself. And if you take a peek at the official photos, you can spot the remnants of the missions. It's important to know all these things, because NASA is planning to send humans back to the moon by 2030. This time, the goal is not just to visit, but to live and work on the moon's surface. NASA has recently launched its powerful Space Launch System rocket, carrying the Orion spacecraft toward the moon. During that trip, there were no crew members. But next time, a cadre of astronauts will make a trip around the moon.
If all goes well, we could use the same spacecraft to land humans on the moon's surface, marking the first time since 1972. It's especially exciting because it might include the first female astronaut to set foot on the moon. Now, the plan is to land near the moon's south pole. Scientists believe that in that area, there might be water. Finding water is crucial because people up there could use it to create rocket fuel for future missions to Mars. Imagine using the moon as a refueling station to reach even farther into space. To support mining and scientific activities, we'd have to build permanent human settlements on the moon. So, picture yourself looking through some cool future telescope that catches everything in detail and seeing someone chilling there on the moon waving at you. But we're far from that yet. The moon still doesn't have many things we take for granted on our beautiful planet, such as water. You know, the real one, like oceans, rivers, lakes, rain, breathable air, and ecosystems to support agriculture. It's a barren and challenging environment. There's no atmosphere that could protect us from space radiation. On Earth, we use sunscreen, but on the moon, we'd undoubtedly have to sweat in those big spacesuits all the time. Also, the moon is vulnerable to solar storms. They can make a mess even here on Earth. Imagine what they can do on the moon. Plus, there are extreme changes in temperature there, together with extended periods of darkness followed by intense sunlight. Okay, the moon may sound exotic, but it would be pretty hard to survive there. We need to figure out what to do with oxygen, too. At first, we could transport air from our planet and pump it into sealed structures where people would live. That would be enough for a small population. But if more people started living there with time, we'd need some different methods to get air. For instance, the soil there has about 45% oxygen, which we could extract. I mean, why not? But before that, let's get ready for a day trip to the moon first. 